Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to continue this study on Judges chapter 13. Just kind of finish this off here this morning. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for our time here uh, in the, this morning, in the morning meetings. Um, we're thankful for the light that you have given us. And we just ask that we can see it more clearly this morning than we did yesterday. Um, we ask for your Holy Spirit uh, to be with each person watching these videos or those participating. We need your voice speaking to us. We need the conviction of your Holy Spirit. And we need your strength and power in our lives. So we come to you asking for these things. Be with us in this study. And um, we ask for your guidance and direction. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> so one of the obvious things that uh, we neglected to point out, though I'm pretty sure that we would have understood this before. Um, when we look at this, this chart that we have here, this is marking um, uh, the, the 40 years, roughly. So... Uh, different ways in which this 40 years can be understood. Um, one is <coughs> we can just deal with the manna as the 494 months, and then we can use that as prophetic months. When we do that, uh, we get two different dates. So if we count from the end of November 9th, 1989, and we count 494 months, lunar months, it brings us to the 10th day of the seventh month, uh, on October 19th, 2029. And we already had marked October 8th, 2030 as being 187 days inclusive from April 5th, 2030, which is this prophetic marker that we got from the week of Christ study. Now, if I take 494 prophetic months, um, it's gonna be longer obviously than the lunar months. And if I count from the end of November 9th, that's going to bring me to uh, Pentecost in 2030, the sixth day of the third month. So that, that's rather interesting that we get that symbol by using the 494 prophetic months. And the other thing that we, we, we neglected to sort of address was if we look at 40 years, um, and we multiply it by 360, so we take it as prophetic years, the, that is 14,400 days. So it's that, that same symbol uh, that we get, for, for instance, for 10 days, 144,000 symbols. So 10 days is 14,400 minutes, 100 days is 144,000 minutes. But 40 years... Is, is also that symbol of 14400. So I, th I thought that was kind of interesting. Now that means, because we've noted this before, that if we, um, you know, the, the 494 weeks is from September 11th, Stephen. So when we count the weeks, from because um, it's 3458 days. Oh, maybe you're right. I don't know. Hang on a second. 3458 days. Yes, that's from July 18th. Okay. Sorry about that. You are correct. So I don't know why. I probably just forgot about that, but okay. So yeah, so this is going to be from July 18th. So that's that's important. It's a good thing you picked up on that. Um, so, um, right, that makes more sense because this is 300 and. 3,207 days. Let me think here. What's going on? 
Um, this is going to bring me to, so let me see. I got to figure out what's going on here. Sorry about this. Here, I'm going to look at my chart. So if I go from July 18, so you probably can't see all this. It's pretty small. So July 18, and I count 3,000, oh, no, 548 days. So where was this from? Was, I need three, uh, four, three. No, it's from November 9th. That's where it's from. That's what it's, it is November 9th. Okay, now I see why I put it at the beginning. Okay, so from, because what I was doing is I was marking from November 9th, 2019. Um, at the beginning when I first put this in the diagram. So now let's go back here. So it's from November 9th, 2019. Not so here we have 494 months from November 9th, 1989. And now we're ca counting 494 weeks from November 9th, 2019. And that's going to bring me to this April 29th, 2029 date. So, so in a sense, the diagram was correct, but it wasn't from November 9th, 1989. It was from November 9th, 2019. So November 9th, 2019, I put here. So this makes it a little bit clearer. But I, I could do this. Um, this and do this. I'm just going to put this here and bring it over here. And just to, to make this. like that if that makes sense to people just that i'm showing that i'm marking this from the november 9th 2019 date that's marked here now we also had something though was september 11th and i can't remember what that was so we didn't put that in there okay and then what we have is a hundred and so when we go to July 18th, uh, 2020, um, we're going to have a, a different number. So yeah. So when I go to July 18th, I have uh, to this April 29th date, I have 3,207 days. No, 3,000. 207 days um, is um, what was it? Well, how did we end up with that number? What was the significance of 3,207 days? Oh, that was just the three, th the third month, the 27th day. Right. Okay. Okay, so that's what that is. And then, um, something else as well. Can't remember what that was. Um, it had something to do with 186 weeks somewhere, but I don't remember where I put that, which was 1,302 days. But, so there's some things I've forgotten. I'm going to have to go and figure out. Um, but anyway, these are our primary... Uh, connections of this line connecting July 18th this structure with um, uh, the 40 years and so July 18th we have as the center because it's that 777 days at the beginning and then 
Um, what we don't have, at least at this point, is 777 days represented at the end. So we have it in the beginning and in the middle. Um, would we expect that it's somehow represented at the end? And, and, and we haven't figured that out, how, how that would be represented symbolically at the end. So it might be something we find out later on. <clears throat> but yeah, if we take this 40 years, right, which is a symbol of the 144,000 in and of itself, but we also have it tied to these symbols of... Um, July 18th, and so that would be one reason to, um, to put July 18th as the center, in a sense that this structure, July 18th, is pulling together Palmoni, and this is all about uh, the story of Samson, he is the preamble to his birth, um, that points to a message that uh, can be understood by this movement symbolically. I just don't remember what we did with September 11th. I know there was something about the number of days. If I cut them in half, they gave us a verse or something. So, um, so We cut the verse in there? Yeah, somehow. Um, oh, that was if you take um, 777 days. So that was, what is this here? That was taking 777 days and cutting them in half to get a verse. Um, and that was... Was it Genesis 38.8 or something like that? Or Numbers 38.8? Can't remember. There was no Numbers 38, so must have been Genesis 38.8. No. Maybe it was Numbers 8.38. Anybody remember? No. And that was some word that we were looking at. So I don't even remember what word it was. Maybe it was the word. Um, anybody remember? I think it was the word that was mentioned 11 times one place and nine times another place. Anyway, that doesn't relate to September 11th. So we're going to have to find that one again. It's amazing how much stuff we can forget in a day. Um, yeah, so from September 11th, 2001 to July 18th, 2020 is 6,885 days. And I can't remember the significance of that. Anybody remember what we did with that? And do I do you remember what the the word was that we were looking at that you had the verse, some verse with 388, but I don't remember what it was. Not off the top of my head, no. Okay, maybe it's numbers.
Oh, the looking glass. That was it. That's okay. Exodus 38, 8. Right. Yeah. yeah. So on the looking glass, so it's talking about um, he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass of the looking glasses of the mirrors of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Right. Yeah. Now, so another point, because um, I was discussing this with William a bit earlier, just clarifying this bit about the looking glasses in Judges 13. So he was focused upon this word countenance in Judges 13.6, right? So still trying to clarify how to understand this. Now, we know it's the same word as vision. Regarding the vision of the evenings and the mornings, right? That right. is the 24 days. Now, we know, of course, that Palmoni is the one that um, is, is going to present the evenings and the mornings, right? And that that word is going to be attached to that symbol. But it's not saying here that we directly take this word and put the 2300 days there. What we can do is we connect, connect it to Palmonai, who gives this vision of the 2300 days. That is the vision that, that Daniel sees in chapter eight, connected with the 2300 days, is the vision of Christ, of Palmonai. Right, in that sense. In that sense. Now, <clears throat> the, way that, the way that I've had to come to understand this, we have accepted and have presented multiple times that the gospel is <clears throat> a three-step prophetic testing message, right? Yeah. How many steps into the sanctuary do we have? Well, there's the courtyard and the holy place, and the most holy place. Three. Here again, we have these three visions. Yeah. Now, I don't really accept this, the, the premise, though, uh, that, that the two, well, the masculine and feminine forms of the words are essentially different. Um, you know, I, I, I don't really accept that. But, um, you know, that they're different parts of things. Because the 2300 days is is something that gives us a revelation of Christ. Just because it's sometimes in the masculine form or sometimes in the feminine form, I don't, I don't really make a distinction. I mean, Strong's does, but a, a Hebrew speaker would, would not. Right, because whether something's in a masculine or feminine form, it just depends on the context. It's not really a different word. But but I know what you're saying. We're we're taking this as, uh, you know, the Kazone is the twenty five twenty, uh, the Mar Mara is the array. Well, it's pronounced Mara, but we we can argue about that some other time. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and and that is um, the the one used in connection with the twenty three hundred days, the evening and the morning. And then we right. have the feminine form in Daniel chapter 10, Mara. Right. And, and, uh, and that feminine form is, is used because of the context of the sentence, not because it's a different word. Because it has to do with um, just the, the grammatical structure of Hebrew. Um, so, but we're, we're going to take it because he... He sees Christ, but he does also in Daniel chapter eight. You know, you can't really, um, you can't argue that in Daniel chapter eight, that somehow uh, this isn't a vision of Christ, but it's just that it's relating to the vision because um, you're going to have the Kazone in chapter 13. 
how long shall be the vision, how long shall be the chazon. And then he's going to give him this verse unto 2,300 evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And then when it says um, he had seen in the vision in verse 15, that's going to be the chazon. And, and then he says, before me was the appearance of a man. So again, you're going to get now this mare or mare, right? Okay. <clears throat> Technically, it's mare. But anyway, what people call a mare. And that's, that's just because it's an appearance of a man, right? So it's, it's going to be in the masculine form in order to agree with the sentence. And then um, he's going to make this man understand the vision, right? So again, it's going to be in the masculine form, right? So that's going to be mare. And then you're going to have, at the time of the end shall be the vision, that's going to be the chazon, right? So you have the chazon there at the, at, in that verse 17. And then, um, then it's going to talk later about the vision of the evening or morning is true in Daniel 8, 26. So here it's going to, instead of saying the vision of the days, it's going to say the vision of the evening and morning. It doesn't say 2300 evenings and mornings, just the vision of the evening and morning. And again, it's going to have to be masculine because of the form of the sentence. And then you're going to have his own again mentioned shut thou up and seal the vision. So it's the chazon that's sealed up, not the 2300 days in this context. Um, and then he, when he says he was astonished at the vision, again, he's going to use the, the mare, right? The, the, the masculine form. Okay. So <clears throat> then when he gets to chapter 10, um, and they're going to use this. I was left as alone and saw this great vision, right? And saw not the vision. They're going to be using the feminine form because of the description of the vision itself. Now, you're going to see that they're going to use the masculine form in verse 6 of Daniel 10, because it says his body was also like the barrel and his face as the appearance. That's going to be the word mare. Right, the, the masculine form of vision of lightning, right? So because you're talking about his face as the appearance, you have to use the masculine form. You, you couldn't use the feminine form there even if you wanted to because it would be a contradiction of genders, right? And then, but then I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. He's going to use the feminine form, the mara, right? For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them. Um, so that's where we're going to have these, these visions. Now, the argument is that, well, this is the looking glass. Um, but the reason why it's referred to as a looking glass has to do with the fact that it's women, women are the ones that use these mirrors. Right? So the reason why it's feminine when it's referring to a mirror because this is referring to it in the context of women using these mirrors. So they have to use the feminine form. So there is nothing in this word that would separate them into two different definitions. They're really the same thing. Uh, so it's the same word, just in two different forms based upon the grammatical structure of the sentence. And... Um, so what I'm saying is that in Judges chapter 13, um, when it talks about his uh, countenance in verse 6, you have to use the masculine form. But I don't see any reason why we can't connect this with um, Daniel 8 or Daniel 10 as, as being something different. So here, this is a revelation of Christ. And we should see the 2300 days as a revelation of Christ. We shouldn't, we shouldn't distinguish those out, in my view. 
we shouldn't try to separate these two things out as two different things or two different parts of the experience. Um, okay, now in that, I've, and I, I'm just going to give a, a personal reason behind this. Okay. I've had to look at the, at the three visions as being separate and distinct. Because the first vision, the calzone, gives you an understanding of, of what is going to go on. And it's what is going to go on throughout the entire of the history. Mm -hmm. Now, Elder Jeff would make the comment that this was the, the panoramic view. Mm hmm he would call the, <clears throat> the vision of the Arab Boker, the evening morning, as the snapshot. Yeah, that's the way Jeff explained it. So you have these two different visions. He calls it the snapshot vision. Um, and the other one's the panoramic vision. Yeah, so okay. he distinguishes them, those two in that way. Yeah. Now, when we get to the looking glass vision. Mm -hmm. Each time that this looking glass vision is brought up, the one that has the experience with the looking glass vision has a very deeply personal revelation. I think if you take a, a look at this, especially as we would go through the other verses, Mm -hmm. The majority of the time, the party that receives this vision falls upon their face. Well, we have it two places. We have it in Ezekiel 1, 1, 1. Well, in Ezekiel 8, 3, we have that same word. And you right. could, um, you know, you have the appearance of, of um, it's going to use it in Ezekiel 43 verse 2 to 3 um, but it's going to use both the masculine and the feminine forms right um, and and he uses the feminine form when he says and the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kibar so um, and, and that's in Strong's and if you look at this in Hebrew um um, let me see here. So this, this is going to be, because it has these different forms of these words. Um, I, I think Strong's is incorrect. So, well, uh, <clears throat> So I don't, I don't think it's actually the feminine form there. I think it's the masculine form. Well, uh, but he misunderstands the the Hebrew grammar because he sees the ot at the end and takes that as feminine. But this is more. This actually has to do with a different type of plural. So, so I, I don't take that verse as being the feminine form at all. So what you have is you just have Ezekiel eight three, Ezekiel. 8 verse 3 and, and 1 verse 1 and um, there you're going to have uh, what's the yeah so that's going to be here in this context it's going to be um, the visions of God he brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north. Um, so this one isn't isn't really this personal vision as such. It's going to be eight verse or chapter one verse one of Ezekiel. I would I would beg to differ because I think that this type of vision coming to a Levite to a priest. Mm -hmm of the vision of the temple would indeed be very personal to him. 
in okay yeah i i just i just don't agree i mean okay. I, I think that this is something that we made too much about um because i see the 2300 days as the personal vision because it is clear in in daniel chapter 8 there is no difference you can't distinguish daniel chapter 8 from ezekiel 8 in the sense of the if you want to talk about it being personal but daniel chapter 10 takes us to where he falls upon his face as if one dead right and the others ran away because they did not see the vision right i understand that so and, but i don't think it has to do with the fact that it's a feminine word is all i'm trying to say i'm okay i agree i agree that that that's what's happening in daniel chapter 10 but it's not because the word is written in the feminine form that, that's all I'm arguing. It has nothing to do with the form of the word that makes it different. Right? It has to do with the Hebrew grammar. Right? Okay. So the Jewish person wouldn't make that distinction. They wouldn't say, they would, they would think it's, it's, it, it is just not a distinction that you would ever make in Hebrew. So they, they wouldn't see that. It's only something that we get from Strong's. Because Strong's for some reason, makes a distinction between the masculine and the feminine for words, even though they're the same word. So in, in a dictionary, you wouldn't look them up and see them as separate words with different meanings. You would just see one as the singular and, and one, um, or one as the masculine and one as the feminine, right? That's all you would see. It, you wouldn't think of them as a different word. And I don't think that we should. I think this is a mistake. That's my opinion. Right. Okay. Um, and yeah. it's always been my opinion about these words because I, I don't see how you can take, um, you know, Daniel 10 and then because it's in the feminine now superimpose every time it's in the feminine, it's it's somehow a different vision. It's a different experience because we, we don't see in in Ezekiel chapter eight. The same thing we see in, in Daniel chapter 10. We don't see him falling down. We don't see any of this type of thing. And yet we say because it's in the feminine, that means it must be this looking class vision. Now, we can see that to some degree in chapter 1, verse 1. But, you know, often we see both of these words together, masculine and feminine, depending on the grammatical structure of the sentence. So it's not like these are singled out in these verses. Right? you know, they they can be used interchangeably depending on the sentence structure. And that's all it is. It just has to be what, what, what's being modified. What's being, uh, you know, modified by, um, you know, it's it becomes like an adjective or whatever, you know. Okay. The, the ultimate point that I was trying to get at, mm -hmm. by the time we get to the book of Revelation, Mm -hmm. but also when we look at a point from the book of Acts, Paul has an experience where he is directly confronted by Christ. Correct? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> given the fact that he was in his own words, a Hebrew among Hebrews, mm -hmm. a Benjamite that learned at the feet of Gamaliel. He is now given this very personal experience. And this very personal experience has nothing to do with either the Calzone or the Arab and Boker, the evening and morning vision. This is one where he is brought to understand his lack and his great need of Christ. Yeah, well, we see that with Job as well. Okay, but I'm I'm just comparing right now into the New Testament. I understand that we see this with Job. Yeah. When it comes to John the Revelator, mm -hmm. he again has a vision, but his vision is this the one that I'm referring to 
causes him to fall on his face as one dead. Mm -hmm. And he is yet raised up. Mm -hmm. Now, again, here is one that learned at the feet of Christ. We are not talking about the calzone. We are not talking about the Arab boker or the, the evening morning vision. This is again one where John has a very personal experience. While the words may be very similar and may rely upon the sentence structure for their definition, they are yet very different experiences depending on the party. In applying Miller's rules, as we have been doing throughout this study, we have experiences that we're seeing with these different ones of our biblical forefathers that have gone before. They have been given an experience. It is a progression of experience because they come to understand their great need of the depth of relationship with Christ. Yeah, so so we understand that. We understand that there is this, um, this personal experience of revelation of Christ, but we don't see... Uh, Mara in connection with Isaiah. We don't see it in connection with Job. And I don't think that, that its presence in Daniel chapter 10 is any special significance as far as the experience itself is concerned. Yes, it is. <clears throat> what we've done is we've picked up on the, on the word and we said, well, here it's, it's, it, it's in the feminine form. And so we try to distinguish it from the evenings and mornings vision of chapter eight. But I don't think it's, there's a distinction being made there. That that personal revelation of Christ is tied to the Mara. And that's why we see here in Judges 13, she has this, this revelation, right? She sees Christ. This is, this is Palmon, Palmonai. This is Daniel chapter eight. But it's also Daniel chapter 10. Because I don't, I don't make a distinction between those two. I don't see that it's some different vision um, that's being used. And, and if we had, you know, this sort of clarified every time that we see this, um, this experience that you're talking about, like obviously John and Paul are in the New Testament. Um, so they, they don't have the Hebrew words there. But I don't, you know, even if even if we we translate it into Hebrew, we wouldn't end up with um, this 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 idea, right? So we don't have it in Job, we don't have it in Isaiah, we do have it in Ezekiel and Daniel, but then they're also in a different type of context in how they're written, right? Because these these are in direct prophecies. Where Job isn't really, a, you know, a direct prophecy; it's a story. Isaiah, Isaiah's is not a direct prophecy, even though it's it's part of his experience. He's going to see, uh, you know, Christ on his throne. He's going to have this revelation of Christ. I just think we make too much of it. Obviously, we do have this progression of experience, and that I'm not denying. I'm just saying that I wouldn't distinguish it out with this word vision. I don't think that that's what we should be doing. I, personally, I don't think it's following Miller's rules correctly. I think it's a misapplication of the rules being misguided by Strong's. How Strong's sing, singles out, you know, distinguishes those words, which if we didn't have Strong's, we wouldn't make that distinction. That's, that's all I'm saying is that we can't base it upon that word vision. Right. That, that's my understanding of it. Right. So that's the position I've always taken. But I understand that there is this progression and I don't sort of deny that. Like, I don't say that somehow 
we're going to, you know, get rid of this idea that there is this progression of understanding that is in connection with understanding prophecy. But I, I don't really like to distinguish this from prophecy itself. I mean, because Daniel, in chapter 10, he's going to be given prophecy, right? He's going to be given, you know, Daniel chapter 11 and 12. And, and that's not some different vision than the 2300 days or the 2520, because in fact, it actually directly relates to that. Uh, Roseanne asked, do we have a date when Palmoni was discovered? Um, well, I've understood Palmoni since uh, the early 80s, so I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's particular to this movement. So I'm, I'm not denying the concept. I'm just denying how we derive it from those words. I, I think that there's other ways to look at it. Do you, do you understand my point? I'm not misunderstanding your point. Because yeah, I, I don't think it goes against what we've been saying. I, it, it, to me, it's more a technical point than anything. Because because I've always believed in this personal revelation of Christ. I just think that we're using this word to 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 attach to it, and I don't think it's necessary. You know, it's not necessary for the concept to work. And the reason why I'm pointing this out here is because I really believe that Judges chapter 13 is representing this personal revelation of Christ. That's, that's sort of my argument here. You know, we can connect it to the 2300 days, but this is really about a personal revelation of Christ. Because that's what this movement is about. Now, in, in the first part, she it, it's like Daniel in Daniel chapter 8. I mean, in a sense, he sees the vision of the evenings and mornings, but he doesn't fully understand it. So the revelation that's going to happen in this chapter is going to happen when uh, the angel of the Lord ascends on these flames. Right, so that's going to be in verse 20. All right. Yeah, and, and the other thing about the word uh, uh, vision there, um, you know, like even in verse 21, if you look at verse 21 and you see this word appear, 7200, it, it's really still the same word as mare and mara. Right. It's still it's still the same word. It just doesn't have the mim at the beginning, you know, the, the M. Because the word vision means uh, the reason why it has the, the mem at the beginning is it's just like when you say he's from Zora, right? Or Manoah from Noah. Right. So in Hebrew, you put that that prefix on a word um, to show that it's from something. So really, literally, it's from an appearance, you know, if you're going to translate it literally, um, from something that is seen. So a vision is from something that is seen. So so even here, you have when you have the word appear, 7200, that in the Strongs, Ra'a, you can just see it doesn't have the ma at the beginning, right? Make sense? At this point, I, you know, I'm not going to disagree with you because you have more training in this with Hebrew. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to read Hebrew. Yeah, I know, but that, that doesn't matter. We don't have to know how to read Hebrew. 
but you know we can use the dictionaries and they're gonna they're gonna tell us some things but you know we have to be careful that we don't misunderstand how a word is being used or what a word means so when i look at the context of this chapter it's pretty clear that once they see the angel ascending the angel of the lord ascending on this flame then they come to understand that they have seen god so in verse 22 manoah said unto his wife we shall surely die because we have seen god so this is what we would call the mirage vision right okay that, that's how we would see it you know in in our understanding of these words we would say well this is a personal revelation of christ I think they're going to die because they now know they've seen god right and he's already revealed his name that it's secret in 13 verse 18 so that it's kind of progressive in how it happens so he shows that he's kalmanai which connects with this idea of this vision that we get from that word uh, mare um it, which daniel chapter 8 but it 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 shows this whole progression of understanding so that fits in with her idea that the name of god is not known and then it's going to be known it's going to be made known so once the name is made known they fall with their faces on the ground right all right you know the name is made known they offer the offering the the angel of the lord ascends in the flame and now they know then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And then he says, you know, we shall surely die because we've seen God. So that's how I understand it. I, I don't like to too, too much to separate out. Because to me, there's two visions. Right. But there's the 2300 days when it's not understood. And the 2300 days when it is understood. And if you want to distinguish that in the feminine, that to me is just an arbit arbitrary distinction. There's not actually two different words being used. But I, I agree with the concept that there is an understanding that is he's going to be made to understand the vision, right? That's what's going to happen in Daniel chapter um, 9 and also chapter 10, right? And, and they're all connected. Because even when you go to uh, Daniel 9, um, and it's going to talk about, uh, and whilst I was speaking and praying, confessing my sins and the sins of my people, that's verse 20, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, who I've seen in the vision in the beginning. There we're going to have the chazon, right? Um, and then he says in verse 23, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Well, it's going to be the 2300 days vision, right? That he's going to be made to understand. But when you get to chapter 10, he's still seeking to understand the return of the people, right? So that's what he was praying about in chapter 9. And now he's fasting about this, right? Because he's um, he understands that, that um, and it says he had understanding of the vision, right? So he understands the 2300 days as far as a time period, but they still haven't returned to the land. So... Cyrus has has become king, you know, six months earlier, and he's still waiting. So he's going to have this uh, vision now in answer to prayer, but it's going to be written with the feminine word. They saw not the vision, right? That's that's the argument that we make that this is now a different vision, so to speak. And, and then we take his, what happens to him, his experience. But we see this also in Judges chapter 13, without the feminine word, a vision. And if anything, we just have the, the word itself, hara, hara, pardon me, ra, um, which means, which also means a vision, a sight, something that's seen. 
but it just doesn't have the mem at the beginning of it. So, so once he understands the vision, right, the 2300 days, the understanding of prophecy can allow us to have a greater experience. But I just don't think it's because we have that word there. Right? We also have the masculine form, too. His body was also like the burrow, and his face is the appearance of lightning, because you're, you're talking about a his, a masculine um, sentence, right? So that the genders have to agree. So you couldn't put the word uh, mora in this sentence because it wouldn't agree with gender. But still, the idea, the concept is correct. It's just... You know, again, it's it's more a technical issue, a technical problem that I have. And, and I think the only reason why I bring it up is because when we go to Judges 13, if we just see Judges 13, we just see, well, this is the masculine form. Then we miss out that this is the same experience in Judges 13 that we have in Daniel chapter 10, Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 8, if you want to put it that way, too. Right. So we can tell anytime we have this revelation of Christ, it, it does it doesn't matter about the word that's attached to it. Right. Because here they're going to use uh, Ra, right, appeared in the seven twenty seven seven thousand two hundred, that definition or that Hebrew word from Strong's. And so when I look at judges. 13 what i'm seeing is that with july 18th that this that we're supposed to have what we call the mara experience that it's tied up there even though we have that mare um word right so we have the masculine form there Because because when I was talking with you, William, about it earlier, I mean, what what we do, which I think is kind of unfair, I mean, it was just we see the word and we say, well, it's just that vision, right? But we know that this word in verse 6, are, that this is not, you just don't take this word and automatically put the 2300 days there. The only reason why here we're going to connect it to the to the prophecy is because this is Palmoni that's being revealed to them. And since it's Palmoni, we can see the significance of the fact that that word is used. The whole story is telling us that same story of Daniel chapter 8 or Daniel chapter 10 or Ezekiel 1, 1 or Isaiah chapter 6 or what happens to Job, or what happens to Paul, or what happens to John. Does that make sense? To anyone? Anybody want to disagree with me? You can. It's fine. I'm sorry. Uh, it does make much clearer sense the way you uh, have explained it. Because um, I was kind of caught up in that, uh, that, that thought pattern um, from before. So, I mean, yeah, it, it, I do understand what you're saying, and, and it's starting to make it a lot clearer. Uh, we're just not looking carefully enough at the sentence structure and what is actually being said and the, uh, the, the different um, uh, things that transpire in, in those uh, lines. Yeah, because yeah, Adventists have noticed the difference in Daniel chapter 8 between the Pazon and, and the Marath. Right. So we've noticed that for a long time. And and especially in understanding the daily, 
but even even before I understood the daily, I understood that it was significant to distinguish those two different words that the that the Mara referred to the 2300 days, the visions of the evening and the morning. And, and then what happened is we saw in Daniel chapter 10, this feminine form of the word, which Strong's gives us a different number. And, and, I, and I don't think the idea was wrong. That is, I would essentially say that it's correct in the, in the idea that we have this progression. I just don't think that the word itself gives us that information. That it's the same vision. It's just an understanding of it. Because he gets this understanding from chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, he, he has this experience because he understands the vision. But it's not because it's in the feminine form that it shows us that. And, and we, so we, when we look at Judges, I see the same story. You know, because this is a prophecy about Christ, isn't it? Is it not? Yeah, right. And and even when you look at his Isaiah, you know, you know, you have Isaiah chapter six. It's going to be followed by Isaiah chapter seven. So he's going to have this vision of the seraphim and so forth, similar to Ezekiel. Ezekiel's is more descriptive. Right. And then he's going to have this um, this coal from off the altar that's going to be put up on his mouth and it touches his lips. His iniquity is taken away. His sin is purged. So we can see that in this experience of Isaiah chapter six, this is a revelation of Christ and a revelation of Christ is necessary in order for us to be transformed in character. Right. It's also prepares him to give a message to God's people. And then he's going to ask the how long question. Right. So that how long question occurs a few times in in in, in scripture. Um, and the answer really is the same, even though it, it it comes in different sort of forms. Because his how long is is he answered until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate. Now in the, in the literal sense here, what is he talking about in the question of the, how long in Isaiah six, verse 11. I'm sorry. I missed that. You asked the question. What was it? So the, the question is, he asked the he asked the question how long, and he gets this answer. And what is the answer referring to in the context of what he's asking? Because this is going to talk like if we read it, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Is this talking about the captivity? Um, right, maybe, the, but it sounds more like it's talking about the land. Well, it's well, yeah, but it's the land. It's it has to do with the 70, 70 years, right, of the rest of the land. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet it shall be a tenth, and it shall return. In it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. So he's saying, even though that you're going to have the land abandoned, God still has a remnant, right? So when he has chapter seven, it's actually what happens here logically follows because this is now the prophecy. So he has a vision and then he's going to be given the prophecy. That's the 65-year prophecy, which is going to be referring to um, 
the beginning of the 2520, both for northern Israel and for Judah. And there's going to be this sign that's going to be given, which is referring to the birth of Manasseh. And also to the fact that the land will be forsaken of both their kings. Because that's going to be the starting point of these periods. So, I mean, he's definitely going to be referring back to um, Leviticus 26. Uh, but here we have this, this child, this king that's going to be born, that's going to be converted, which is Manasseh. But he becomes a type of Christ. So in all of these, um, these illustrations of a personal experience, there's a prophecy that's given. So in Judges 13, this prophecy, of course, is going to be about the same thing as Isaiah's prophecy is about. It's going to be about Christ, ultimately. But in dealing with the local literal events first. And, and that's why I'm concerned about how we understand Judges 13, because if we don't see this personal revelation of Christ, because we don't have the right word there, we're, we're going to miss it. But we have the experience. Everything here is the same. So when we look at this diagram then, so let's go back here. We have the name not known and the name known. Are we correct in putting July 18th, marking it as Judges 1313, the center of the chiasm? It's not literally time-wise the center of the chiasm. But it but it's if if we go from uh, you know like there's no way that we can make this identical to the center that like chronologically. But is it, is it thematically the center? Does July 18th provide the cross, which becomes the revelation of Christ that ends up resulting in understanding and knowing who Christ is and us seeing our sins and then preparing us to give a message. Or would we look for some other date to fulfill that purpose? So, um, I, I'm, I was, I, I don't know why exactly. I didn't like 187. And I leaned a little more to the uh, November ninth, uh, uh, twenty eighteen date. I think. And and the only reason that was uh, was because of the you know all the preparatory stuff to that point, and then all of a sudden. Um, there was this big bang, and then there was a, a, a separation. I think. Uh, I think it was the uh, we were leading up to like the second angel's message, or were we in the second angel's or the third? Uh, I, I'm trying to see the micro. You know, there's appears that we've got these three step testing processes um, that happen in our line on a uh, at, at, at a real good basis. Um, okay, well, I'm having a hard time hearing you. They lead up to your breaking oh, sorry. up. But so I think I understand what your point is. So if I can comment on that, so. So when we look at July 18th, I mean, we're having it here connected to November 9th and 
December 25th, 2021. So this becomes this period of time in which this movement enters into a revelation of Christ. Would, would we agree with that? That it's a different period than we had prior to uh, this movement. That November 9th changes things. That here we have a three-step testing prophetic message, if you want to look at it. We're from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. Right? Zooming into July 18th. Those, those dates on either side give us this, um, this experience, right? This whole span of time occurs within that, or this whole our experience occurs within that. Okay. So we, we get the revelation of Christ, but then we're going to be given the message. Right? So first you need the revelation of Christ. And, and so it's illustrated here, typically within this movement, by what happened from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. But now we have to give the message, right? So that message, or at least understand the message further. So the message is given to us in the studies that we are doing. And that message points us to dates in the future that are symbolic. We have Passover, we have the Day of Atonement, and we have Pentecost as symbols, tying us to November 9th, whether it's 1989 or 2019. Yes. Right? And... So for us to understand this in Judges 13.13 13, is that Judges 13.13 13 is represent, well, Judges 13, but we have it as the center. So the center of this chiasm, this whole chiasm represents that experience that this movement went through before Christ can be born in us. Because Samson is going to be a message, and it's a message about the revelation of Christ. But it's done in an ironic way, right? So we have Samson in this sort of um, uh, you know, it's it's the human nature aspect, I guess. It's it's us. It's not it, you know, Christ is glorified, but it's not because we are 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 somehow special or different. We're still just humans, right? We're still just people. Correct. We have a fallen human nature. And yet God is somehow going to use us just as he used Samson. And for some people, you know, that, that becomes a problem. The story of Samson representing Christ, some people don't like it. Um, they find that it's, you know, some people find it offensive or something like that. Um, but, you know, it, he's definitely a type of Christ, just ironically. So some people can't get their mind around that. But, but it's important for us to understand what our experience was, what we experienced in that 777 days. Because it was rather intense. Not just before July 18th, but also after. So is there anything else we need to discuss regarding Judges 13?
So everybody's satisfied with Judges 13, with what we've done with it at this point. It seems as though we need to uh, spend some time in thoughtful prayer and consideration for this. Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I personally don't like disagreeing with Dwight, and I'm, I'm not trying to, right? Because because I understand the importance of this three-step experience. I just think that we need to see it in Judges 13, even though we don't have the right word. Because, because I think it does represent it does represent a, a truth, right? I mean, you know, and another example is the Millerites arrived at the correct day for October twenty second, eighteen forty four, even though they didn't fully understand the calendar they were using, right? Um, Hir Hiram, uh, not Hiram Metzen, um, Josiah Litch arrived at the correct date for the end of this, the second woe, even though he didn't use the biblical calendar and his way of coming up with uh, August 11th was almost, we would say, by accident that he got the right day. But we wouldn't say because he didn't have exactly a correct understanding how to arrive at that day that we somehow dismiss his, his conclusion, right? Uh, no, we don't. No. Because God leads us in his providences to see certain things. And I believe it was important for this movement, and I still think it's important, that we understand about this personal revelation of Christ. But it, it comes from prophecy. Right. It's, it's not going to come about because for many people, and, and this is my experience before I was in this movement. We focused on the, the third angel's message of righteousness by faith. And we saw this need of this revelation of Christ. We would see this in all these different verses we've talked about. Uh, and especially in John, in, in the book of Revelation with John. Um that that revelation of Christ uh, was needed, but we didn't really connect it with prophecy per se. It was, even though John has this revelation of Christ before he's given this vision that he's going to write out, um, we sort of separate the two. You know, there's this personal experience that we need to have, um, but we don't connect it with, with prophecy one is that prophecy brings it about but also that it's preparing us to prophesy so dwight do you have problems with any of this or any thoughts In this situation, one of the one of the points that I think we're all going to have to address is that there's going to be times that we're going to disagree with one another. The disciples did not agree with each other on every point, mm -hmm. but they could be respectful in their disagreements well m later on after they were converted yes <laughs> well <clears throat> you don't find peter in full agreement in, in full agreement with the Z simon the zealot right yeah you don't find matthew in full agreement 
with John. Mm -hmm. But they all understood that there is a goal that has been presented before them and that they need to be able to at times set aside their disagreements over minor items in order to accomplish the greater goal for the greater good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, it is a technical point that we're making, but we are in agreement about the process. Right? As far as the connection of prophecy to this experience. Correct. Mm -hmm. Where some people try to single, you know, divide this out. You know, this experience is just something that happens. And, and of course, in the, you know, the conservative Adventist uh, realm, it would be, you know, getting to know Christ personally. Um, you know, there's all these types of things we do. So one day this, this revelation of Christ will just happen because we're obeying God. And yet, it's not going to happen apart from prophecy. Well, the problem, especially within the corporate church, is that they believe that the message of righteousness by faith has been fully accepted. Mm -hmm. However... Had this message been fully accepted, we wouldn't be here right now. Right. Now, looking at this as a three-step process, as we come into this third step, we come to a more clear understanding of what righteousness by faith really means. And that has been the purpose of the Friday night studies. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, I separate these into separate experiences. I do not have the understanding of Hebrew grammar or syntax. My understanding of English grammar and syntax is at times very rudimentary. But seeing the experience that each of these had gone through and understanding how it, they were affected by this experience has given me a little bit more understanding of where we need to be at this time in our understanding of righteousness by faith. And, and I think that's the big issue. I mean, we see that it happens progressively in a three-step testing prophetic fashion. Right? We go through an experience... Um, it doesn't just happen out of nowhere, right? It cannot happen out of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's like saying that righteousness by faith is an evolution of our faith. Ah, yeah. And, and, and that's what I think that most Christians and, and, and Adventist included in that, see it just sort of as, and, and there, in some ways it's not wrong. I mean, there is a development, there is a process, but they're looking that someday in the future, they will be perfect. Wherever that is, they're going to base it upon some kind of magical thing that happens to them. Right? I believe that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they don't understand that the part that they have to play progressively in this, that that is, they think that they can get the experience of the third angel's message without the experience of the first and second.
how is that different from the understanding that life came from nothing and that intelligence was developed by pure chance? Yeah. It's not any different. That's why Jones does uh, a sermon called, Are You an Evolutionist? Because if you believe that it, that righteousness by faith is just an evolution, then you're an evolutionist, right? So he says it's it's actually a a miracle that happens through the cooperation of of Christ with the individual. So that's uh, to me an extremely important point to understand. But for many many people, it's it's evolution. So, um, so that ends up being, uh, I mean, for, for many, and I, I have to say this for many within the corporate church, this is evolution by faith. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. So hopefully we, we've tied up those things here. So before we go into uh, Judges 14 into any kind of detail, um, the only thing that we, we can say when we looked at, at, at Samson, um, we, didn't, we didn't draw it out on a line per se, but we, we could reach Samson back. That is, he has a place within our lines. And in some ways, his, his experience is sort of a summary of this movement. And we have sort of the, the early experience of Samson. And, um, you know, his, his situation with wanting to get married and all those types of things. And then those are going to progress um, to his his situation with um, uh, Delilah, right? So uh, first with his, his wife and then Delilah, right? So you're going to have, I guess it's three chapters in Samson, right? So we have three ch chapters. And um, so things to consider is if we're going to have these three chapters, are they representing a three-step testing prophetic message again? Or, or are we going to tie them just to, well, I mean, by tying them to different dates that illustrate that within our movement? So that would be uh, how we're going to look at Judges 14, 15, and 16. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Not at this time. Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful uh, for the time that we have had this morning. We ask, Lord, that you can, that we can be connected with you, that our hearts uh, can be united through thy spirit. Uh, we know, Lord, that we only see through a glass darkly. We do not see everything uh, clearly. But we can cling to you by faith. And we can have this revelation of Christ, that we can see you face to face, that we can be undone, that we can be transformed, that we can be used by you, and Lord, we just ask that even in our disagreements, even in our um, experience with others that don't always sit right with us, Lord, that you can help us to see ourselves as we really are. We pray for this movement and the decisions that need to be made regarding this weekend. And we just pray for your continued guidance and blessing. We're thankful, Lord, for the answers to prayer 
uh, that we continue to have. And we pray, Lord, that you can use us to your glory. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.